Generally speaking, Nintendo is one of the most beloved companies on Earth, but for a handful of folks out there, the company has caused nothing but pain and financial turmoil. See, over the years, Nintendo has proven to be quite litigious, with the company aggressively going after any who dare to violate its intellectual property rights and those who threaten the company's family-friendly branding. Many of these disputes have resulted in civil lawsuits, and some who have crossed the big N have even been thrown into prison. From a man named Bowser being jailed by Nintendo, to an 18-year-old Nintendo hacker arrested for CP, to an Australian Nintendo fanatic sued by the company for sharing his copy of New Super Mario Bros. Wii, these are the folks who crossed Nintendo and lost everything in the process. Our first story details what might be Nintendo's most brutal legal pursuance in the company's history. An intellectual property dilemma that bizarrely enough resulted in a man with the last name Bowser getting thrown into prison. This is the Gary Bowser story. Gary Bowser is a technology enthusiast from Montreal, Canada. Bowser had been obsessed with electronics since he was a young boy, first tinkering with model trains. His penchant for gadgets and tech only grew with age. In the 1980s, the young man became heavily interested with video gaming and computers, and he made up the cohort of what some might call the first generation of PC gamers. Gary's knack for computers and gaming ultimately resulted in him starting a small computer computer business. He was an OG computer whiz and was an expert at navigating operating systems and repairing broken machines. The man had turned his beloved childhood hobby into a career, and he would find success in this industry for decades. But what we find is that Gary Bowser eventually wanted a little bit more of a challenge, as he grew tired with performing routine computer repairs and selling new products. And sadly, to scratch this itch, Gary would turn to the criminal world of hacking, cracking open proprietary software for his own amusement. Fast forwarding a bit to the early 2010s, Gary Bowser at this time was a member of a notorious online hacking circle known as Team Executor. Executor was known for developing gaming mod chips and jailbreak devices used to circumvent copy protection native to gaming consoles. Team Executor targeted the Nintendo 3DS, GameCube, NES Classic Edition, Sony PlayStation, Microsoft Xbox, the 360, and most notoriously the Nintendo Switch, and I'll explain explain the notorious nature of that in a little bit. Team Executor's hacking activities were extremely illegal, and the group was known by international authorities as a criminal enterprise. Bowser was a competent hacker, but the man's primary role in Executor was developing the team's websites, setting up promotions, and getting in contact with black market retailers who would sell their jailbreaking chips. Through the summer of 2013 all the way to the summer of 2020, Gary Bowser and his team Executor affiliates used a variety of product names for their devices, such as the Gateway 3DS, the Stargate, the True Blue Mini, the Classic 2 Magic, and the SX line of devices that included the SX OS, the SX Pro, the SX Lite, and the SX Core. An individual could purchase one of their copy protection circumvention devices, put it in their hardware, and essentially download any pirated game to it. Team Executor tried to camouflage their illegal activity by promoting their products as a way for aspiring game developers to design their own video games for non-commercial use. But let's keep it real, people were buying this shit so they could just download games illegally. Team Executor's brazen pirating would continue on for years unchecked, but eventually the team would fly too close to the sun. That of course being when they finally developed and began distributing a copy protection circumvention tool for Nintendo Switch, which was the hottest console in the world at the time and uh... It was also made by Nintendo, the most copy protective company in the fucking world. Eager to extinguish any threat to their golden goose that was the Nintendo Switch, the company quickly caught on to Team Executor's practices and immediately began trying to track down those in the syndicate. Nintendo would eventually uncover some of the identities of these individuals and started issuing out legal threats, which would turn into a multi-year-long legal battle ending with a man in prison. After the involvement of federal authorities in September of 2020, several members of Team Executor, including Gary Bowser, were arrested. At the time, Bowser was living in the Dominican Republic, 
He was deported from the country and compelled to appear in federal court shortly after to face criminal charges stemming from his involvement in the Nintendo IP hacking ring. The contextually hilariously named Gary Bowser was charged with 11 felony counts, including but not limited to conspiracy to commit wire fraud, wire fraud itself, conspiracy to commit money laundering, conspiracy to circumvent technological measures, and to traffic and circumvention devices, and trafficking and circumvention convention devices. The wiring and money laundering charges were each punishable with a sentence of up to 20 years in prison, and the conspiracy and trafficking circumvention charges were punishable with a sentence of up to five years. However, it turned out that Gary's involvement on the hacking side of things was actually rather limited. It was later found that Gary Bowser didn't have any major responsibilities in producing the products used to circumvent Nintendo game systems, and the man simply acted as a marketing and PR manager for the Executor product team. However, ironically, despite his limited role on the hacking side of things, Gary Bowser would be the only person from the team to receive a prison sentence in the United States. Prosecutors essentially considered Gary Bowser the public face of the company, and his marketing ability is what got these circumvention products into the hands of consumers around the world. Or maybe prosecutors thought it would be funny to convict a man named Gary Bowser in a trial involving Nintendo. I don't know. <laughs> In 2021, Bowser pled guilty to the two remaining charges against him, stemming from the Nintendo lawsuit, and agreed to help law enforcement in finding the other members in exchange for a reduction of charges. He was ultimately sentenced to serve 40 months in prison. It's been said that Gary Bowser's involvement in Team Executor's illegal scheme netted him close to $300,000. Unfortunately for Gary though, this 300k wouldn't be enough to offset the damages he would face after he was sued by Nintendo. Since being convicted, Gary Bowser was personally sued by Nintendo and has been compelled to pay $10 million in order to settle this lawsuit. The man is now in enormous debt and will reportedly have to pay Nintendo stipends from his paychecks for the the rest of his life. In a recent podcast appearance filmed in April of 2023, Gary Bowser revealed that he was being held at the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma, Washington. In this chat, he announced that he was awaiting processing to get out of prison early for good behavior. So, so Gary, when, when you, you get, get out, out of, what's, what's the, the, the time frame, frame thing of when you should be finally processed and they, you know, you know I, I guess, guess deport, deport you to where, where you're going? going. Uh, how does how, how is that? that? Well, the, the, the good thing is I already went to court, court once I was in uh, quarantine. So uh, I did my court on April the 4th. Okay. And, and then I was already filled with all my documentation on April the 7th. But now I'm just waiting for the, the new passport and everything. That's uh, the good thing is I'm further along than almost everybody here. A lot of people have been spending three to six months in the facility. <laughs> What will become of the man after the fact remains unknown, but needless to say, if this man has any sense, he'll never cross Nintendo again. Pokemon is Nintendo's second most valuable intellectual property, with only Mario himself beating out this beloved franchise. And like with all of Nintendo's creations, the brand's family-friendly image is protected at all costs. That being said, our next story involves two young men that attempted to commit a heinous crime at a sanctioned Pokemon card game tournament, their actions landing them in prison. The Pokemon World Championship is an invite-only tournament sanctioned by the Pokemon Company itself, which is under Nintendo's ownership. The first Pokemon World Championship began in 2004 and has been an annual occurrence ever since, with thousands being in attendance each year. For the sake of this story, we'll be discussing the Pokemon World Championship from 2015 and some disturbing events that unfolded during it. This whole debacle begins with 18-year-old Kevin Norton and 27-year-old James Stumbo. Both of these men were known in the competitive Pokemon community and were considered high-level Pokemon trading card game players. So much so that they received invitations to compete in the 2015 championship. Kevin and James were friends, often talking online and commiserating at smaller local Pokemon tournaments in Iowa. 
which is the state where the young men were from. Now, as a player, being invited to the most prestigious Pokemon trading card game tournament would be an honor, at least you would think. In the wake of the invitations, you might imagine the boys would graciously thank the community or the Pokemon company for sending them these invitations. But no, that, that's not what they did at all. Oddly enough, what we got instead was the boys taking to social media, issuing veiled threats of violence targeting the event itself in the days leading up to it. For example, just two days before the tournament was to take place, James Stumbo would post the following warning to his Facebook page. Kevin Norton and I are ready for worlds. Boston, here we come. This blurb was ominously paired with an image featuring an AR-15 and a pump-action shotgun placed on the trunk of a white sedan. In the replies, one Facebook user wrote, good luck, and Kevin Norton replies, with killing the competition? The other user says, haha, yes. It's also alleged that around this time, Kevin and James had made various threats of violence on a Pokemon trading card game forum. One of these threats was reportedly noticed by one of the moderators and passed along to the security team of the Pokemon trading card game event. However, at the time, many that knew Kevin and James personally weren't particularly alarmed by these Facebook and social media posts. As apparently, James Stumbo in particular maintained a sarcastic, edgy online persona, and many in the community passed these threats off as just another attempt at online provocation. Whatever the case, eventually worlds would come and Kevin and James would make their way to Boston to compete, to attack, Nobody really knew. And fortunately, we never had to find out the answer to this question because Kevin and James were never allowed inside of the Pokemon Convention Center. On August 20th of 2015, members of the Boston Regional Intelligence Center had received the Pokemon Forum moderator's tip regarding the threats of violence issued by the two on social media. And as a result of this, Kevin and James were stopped while trying to register at the event itself. When questioned by the authorities about the threats they had made online, James Stumbo said that his messages were taken out of context and his messages were nothing more than a comedic bit. But how much of a bit really was it? As it's reported later in his interview with the police that he confessed to having guns in his vehicle at the time. Naturally, this admission was extremely disturbing with the context of the Facebook post. So after he admitted this, police seized Kevin and James's vehicle. The two men weren't initially detained and they stayed at a motel as they awaited further instruction from law enforcement. The following day, a search warrant was granted and the police looked for guns inside of their vehicle. What they discovered was a 12 gauge Remington shotgun and one DPMS model AR-15. Police also found several rounds of ammunition and a hunting knife. Yeah, it was looking like Kevin and James may have actually had plans to commit something like what they described or hinted at in that Facebook post. And if that was the case, a potential mass shooting had been thwarted thanks to the anonymous tip given by this Pokemon forum moderator. After discovering their arsenal, an arrest warrant was then issued for both Kevin and James and they were soon taken into custody at their motel in Saugus, Massachusetts. The men charged with unlawful possession of a firearm as well as some other firearm offenses. In the wake of Kevin Norton and James Stumbo's arrest, the Pokemon company itself would comment on the situation. Prior to the event this weekend, our community of players made us aware of a security issue. We gathered information and gave it as soon as possible to the authorities at John B. Hines Veteran Memorial Convention Center who acted swiftly and spearheaded communication with the Boston Police Department. Due to quick action, the potential threat was resolved. The Pokemon Company International takes the safety of our fans seriously and will continue to ensure proper security measures are a priority. I'm telling you, man, Pokemon, Nintendo, don't fuck with these guys. They're gonna get you. You're gonna get got. As I mentioned briefly earlier, it's not known to this day what the boys' intentions were with their attendance of the Pokemon event. In the wake of the arrest, Pokemon card expert Josh Squeaky Marking went to bat for James Stumbo and has gone on record calling Stumbo a, quote, pretty chill and reserved guy. With this community member who had spoken with Stumbo before kind of believing that this was just an edgy joke that had been taken extremely too far, Squeaky had this to say, 
Quote, every time I did an interview with him, he always seemed like a chill person, but he is also the type to be sarcastic and joke around. And this line of thinking would be an argument that James and Kevin's defenses would attempt to make while in court. The men's defense attorneys tried to argue that the alleged threats made were simply idle online chatter and edgy banter. However, it was later revealed that the two had sent threatening messages to other members that would be attending the convention itself. One of them read, quote, my AR-15 says that you'll lose. Edgy joke, possible, death threat, also possible. In July of 2016, Kevin and James would change their verdict from not guilty to guilty. James Stumbo pled guilty for possession of the rifle and Norton pled guilty for possession of the shotgun and both would admit guilt for possessing the ammunition. Both Kevin Norton and James Stumbo were ultimately sentenced to serve two years in prison as well as two years of probation and were ordered to undergo mental health evaluation. All I gotta say in wrapping this story up is big shout out to that Pokemon on forum moderator that gave the initial tip that got the ball rolling with these guys getting arrested as if that wasn't the case we could have been dealing with another David Katz situation here we'll learn about another Nintendo violating miscreant after a brief message from today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Keeps, and to begin the ad, I'd like for you to take a look at my hairline from old videos back in 2020. Yeah, your boy was losing hair and losing it fast. I didn't want to go bald, so I decided to do something about my hair loss and got started with Keeps, and the results have been pretty insane. This is me at six months after starting Keeps. This is me a year after starting, two years after starting, and this is me now, almost three years after starting Keeps. And if you ask me, I think this stuff has worked pretty well, at least in comparison to where we were at before. Keeps offers generic versions of the two FDA approved hair loss products at a can't beat price. And best of all, you skip the trip to the doctor's office and pharmacy. Keeps will set you up with a prescriber online and ship your prescription right to your front door. And in four to six months, you should start seeing results. Look guys, I honestly consider myself like a keep success story i stand by this stuff and if you're having some anxiety about hair loss there's no better time than now to start keeps hair loss stops with keeps and you guys can go to keeps.com wavy to get started and take advantage of their special offer that's k-e-e-p-s dot com slash wavy this next story involves one of Nintendo's most notorious hackers, a man so infamous that he was looked into by the FBI, who ultimately ended up busting him for a completely different crime. Ryan S. Hernandez, aka Ryan West, who also went by the online alias Ryan Rocks, was a teenager from Palmdale, California. The young man had already gained notoriety for being quite the hacker at only 16 years old. In 2016, Ryan and an online associate managed to use a deceitful phishing technique and stole the credentials of a Nintendo employee. This exploit was used to gain access to confidential files related to Nintendo's consoles and games. Some of this hacked info included pre-release data regarding the Nintendo Switch, which hadn't even been announced yet. Ryan would leak this Nintendo Switch information information to the public, which included specs and the actual physical design of the console itself. Naturally, Nintendo considered their unannounced console being leaked onto the internet a pretty big deal, and they managed to track old Ryan down with the help of the FBI. The feds were on the case and investigated the breach which led them down a virtual trail all the way to Ryan's real life house. FBI agents would make contact with Ryan Hernandez at his parents place in California. After being confronted by the feds, the young man promised to stop any further cybercrime activity and said that he understood the consequences if he tried to hack Nintendo again. Those consequences being, he would be arrested and taken to jail, even if he was a minor. So the feds pretty much gave Ryan a slap on the wrist, told him to not hack Nintendo anymore, and they went on their way. And you might think that Ryan would count this as a blessing and stop his cyber criminal activities, but no, that's not the case at all. Ryan got right back into his hacking hobbies, and in fact took to social media to mock the FBI after they had left his house. From the summer of 2018 to the summer of 2019, Ryan made frequent attempts at hacking Nintendo, and 
and getting new Nintendo leaks. At one point, Ryan managed to hack into multiple Nintendo servers and stole more confidential information about popular video games and gaming consoles that were on the horizon. This was a time when tons of Nintendo leaks were coming out of the woodwork. You might remember the Nintendo Giga leak, which revealed a lot of old information about canceled Nintendo games, which included old canceled Pokemon sprites, the actual Luigi model from Mario 64, and a plethora of other insane lost Nintendo shit that was just kept on their servers. It's never been officially confirmed that Ryan was directly involved in the Giga Leaks, but he was rubbing shoulders with these guys and trying to pry into Nintendo's servers in a similar way. At the peak of Ryan's hacking spree, he maintained a braggadocious internet personality, frequently publicly boasting about his exploits on Twitter and in Discord. That Discord being Ryan's underground hangout where he would collaborate with other hackers in an effort to find new leaks. Eventually, the FBI would discover Ryan's Discord and that he had resumed his hacking activities, so they decided to pay him another visit. And this visit from the FBI would result in an arrest, but not for the crime that you're expecting. Within these hard drives, the feds indeed found evidence proving that he had continued his Nintendo hacking endeavors. However, inside these hard drives, the FBI found something far more concerning. Forensic analysis of his devices revealed that Ryan had used the internet to collect more than 1,000 videos and images of minors engaging in sexually explicit conduct. Ryan had stored this despicable content in a folder titled, quote, bad stuff. After the discovery of this CP collection, Ryan Hernandez, the famous Nintendo leaker, was immediately arrested. In April of 2020, at the age of 21, Ryan pled guilty to the federal charges of both computer fraud and abuse and possessing CP. The man's sentencing was delayed due to COVID-19 restraints. But eventually, on December 2nd of 2020, Ryan was sentenced to serve three years in prison, and after this sentence, he is to serve seven years of supervised release and must register as a sex offender. Ryan has also agreed to pay a fine of $259,323 in restitution towards Nintendo. The sheer absolute brazen behavior displayed by Ryan, I mean, Having direct interaction with the FBI, having CP on your computer all the while you're actively hacking a Nintendo, this guy was just a real f***ing degenerate. And I have no issues with Nintendo and the feds coming after him. Back before digital video game releases, generally speaking, Australia was the last region in the world to get access to a game on store shelves. However, there were some exceptions to this rule, with some releases involving Australians getting first dibs. And this story involves a man who, even with the early Australian release, couldn't wait to get his hands on New Super Mario Bros. Wii, and his actions led him to face serious civil consequences. The story begins in November of 2009 with 24-year-old James Burt, a part-time freight worker in Cinnamon Park, Queensland, Australia. James lived with his parents at the time and had been described as a video game fanatic with a particular interest in Nintendo games and merchandise. One of the most anticipated Nintendo titles of 2009 was New Super Mario Bros. Wii a multiplayer adaptation and expansion of the ideas presented in New Super Mario Bros. DS. You've all played this game, I don't even know why I'm explaining it to you. The game was primed to be a hot holiday commodity, and James Burt couldn't wait to get his hands on it. And fortunately for the man, this was one of those rare instances where Australia was actually slated to get access to the game before everybody else. With Australia getting it November 12th, USA November 15th, EU the 20th, and Japan on December the 3rd. But this November 12th release, see, James didn't even have to wait that long to get the game. As days before the new Super Mario Bros. Wii release, James was browsing around a local retail store's video game section and stumbled across an impossible site. That site being new Super Mario Bros. Wii on the shelf and available for purchase. Apparently, the retailer had mixed up the release date and put the game available for purchase on shelf days before Nintendo had intended. Thrilled at the idea of being one of the first in the world to play this game, James bought it and excitedly took his copy of NSMB Wii home. 
And needless to say, New Super Mario Bros. Wii is a great game, and James quite enjoyed it. He felt like the luckiest man on earth. However, James's luck would sour after he logs onto an internet forum and starts bragging about his find. After playing his forbidden Mario Bros. release for some time, James took to the internet to gloat in the face of other Nintendo gamers, flaunting his luck in finding and playing the new Super Mario Bros. game before its official release date. But forum users didn't believe his stories and started doubting him, claiming he was making things up and asked for him to post some sort of proof that he had the title. Most in this situation would probably go as far as uploading photos or videos of themselves playing the game. But James went even further. On November 6th of 2009, James Burt uploaded a game file extracted from his copy of New Super Mario Bros onto the internet in an effort to concretely prove that he had access to the game. This would prove to be a life-ruining mistake. While James certainly confirmed ownership of the game with his file, he had also essentially engaged in piracy by uploading it, as it wouldn't take long for anonymous internet users to bypass the copy protection of the new Super Mario Bros. game uploaded by James. These hackers essentially turning the game data uploaded by him to a publicly available ROM download for an unreleased title. And it's been reported that this file was accessed by close to 50,000 people. The copyright sears over it Nintendo almost immediately detected this disturbance in the force and sought out James Burt. Alleging the man of facilitating piracy, Nintendo sought out retribution, and on November 23rd of 2009, the company applied for a search order, as well as access to his social media accounts and emails. When the search was approved and executed, it gave Nintendo all the proof they needed. James had been caught red-handed. Nintendo would bring James to court for breaching Australia's Copyright Act, which essentially postulated that James Burt would have had to have had permission from Nintendo before posting the game data to the internet. Several months later, in January of 2010, the man would ultimately decide to settle out of court for 1.5 million AUD. James would disappear after this settlement, and many assumed that the man had entered some sort of crippling depression after being hit with the hefty legal bill. However, the man would eventually pop up online again, and particularly on Reddit in December of 2013. His post read as follows, Aussie Nintendo Pirate gets a gift from Nintendo. What? Hey there, James Burt from Australia here. Just saying I think it's ironic that out of everyone in Australia they could have chosen, I get given a Ganon statue for being a good customer of Nintendo. And the way that he writes this makes it seem like Nintendo had sent him this Ganon statue as like a F you, you know, after the fact, but it actually has nothing to do with that. He got this from an EB game store, like they had sent it to him. But anyways, this was the same statue given out in the UK for Wind Waker HD pre-orders, however, was not here in Australia. I was told I was chosen from Nintendo and received it today. I'm very grateful they chose me. Don't get me wrong, and I still do love Nintendo even after being sued. One Redditor asks, so how's life been since the lawsuit? James says, found a girl, got married, and had a kid. Seriously, run a gaming site called GameDriveTeam.com and have a YouTube slash GameDrive channel show both newly started. James has spoken on his lawsuit on several occasions using YouTube videos, but further details in regarding if he's actually having to make the payments of his settlements remain unknown. Something I did in 2009 is still making traction around the internet. Every now and again, you get different creators I'll put them on the screen, making videos about the, the time that I got sued by Nintendo. And um, not, every, it, not every part of it is true. So I'm going to make this my main YouTube channel from now on, being that my name is synonymous with things that have happened in the past. And I guess I can't run from that all. For those of you who come from a, a certain video that went up recently, and there's a picture of me on the thumbnail. That was from 12 years ago. I don't look like that anymore. <laughs> Things have changed uh, in 12. I'd like to welcome you all to a little novelty Nintendo lightning round. These are stories that fit this overarching topic, but aren't really long enough for me to make whole chapters about. Let's get into it. Wario Ecstasy Pills. Ecstasy, MDMA, Molly, these pills tend to be quite cartoony, colorful, and come in all shapes and sizes, many of which have logos and brands pressed into them. You got Facebook Molly, Tesla Molly, Sprite Molly, you name it. 
One of the most bizarre are the Wario-shaped ones. On June 25th of 2019, a Japanese man named Satoshi Kosmoto was arrested in Tokushima, Japan for carrying 50 Wario-shaped ecstasy pills. It was the man's third offense for the possession of such drugs. Apparently, Satoshi was trying to smuggle the Wario narcotics into Japan from the Netherlands and Spain. According to drugsdata.org, it's alleged that the Wario ecstasy tablets are sourced from Switzerland. Fittingly, these Wario tablets also appear to pack quite the punch, reportedly containing upwards of 300 milligrams of MDMA, which is double of what is considered an already high dosage. Many on Reddit have noted that Wario-sized tablets are actually quite the shrewd method of reducing your potential prison time if ever busted with these pillies. As the fewer pills you're caught with, the better. Quote, I've heard it's more from a legal point of view. Getting caught up with one or two pills is unlikely to result in serious repercussions. So you load them pills as high as you can so you don't need to carry so many. Also works from a marketing point of view. And if you want a recognizable character that takes up a lot of volume, Wario certainly is a good pick. Our next story, child predators allegedly sending nude imagery using a Nintendo DS app. Swapnote was a free to download Nintendo app that allowed users to create and share handwritten notes and drawings. It became available in December of 2011. The app allowed you to transfer files through SpotPass and link up with other friends on devices such as the 3DS. In April of 2013, Swapnote was updated by Nintendo to allow its users to send audio recordings and images. The app seems innocent enough and was obviously meant for kids to link up and share drawings with each other, but unfortunately the old adage of never trust anyone online rings true here, as insidious deviants quickly flocked to the app, infiltrating it, and used it to solicit imagery of children. In November and December of 2012 in Japan, a 44-year-old man had sent four nude photos through the Swap Note app to two girls aged 11 and 12. This disturbing story made headlines in Japan, and the Swap Note service would be discontinued the following year by Nintendo. The last in this rapid fire round is Marikar. Marikar was slash is a Tokyo based company dedicated to the gimmick of Mario Kart in real life. They used go-karts and actual Mario related costumes to sort of recreate a Mario Kart game, but on the streets in the real world. Riders donned the costumes of various beloved Nintendo characters like Mario, Luigi, Yoshi, and more, and pitted friends and family while in costume against each other, bringing the video game to reality. The branding and the name of this company obviously extremely derivative of Nintendo's intellectual property. However, as you can imagine, Nintendo wasn't very happy with the go-kart company using their intellectual property. In February of 2017, Nintendo would file a lawsuit against Marikar and stated that the company never obtained permission to use the costumes that the entire business built its premise off of. After receiving legal threats from Nintendo, Marikar would rename themselves to Mari Mobility Development, but this didn't stop Nintendo from coming after them. In December of 2020, after three years of battling Nintendo, Marikar lost a civil case in the District Court of Tokyo, and Nintendo was awarded $400. $180,000 in restitution and banned the kart racing company from ever using their IP. The company would still be allowed to provide go-kart racing services for patrons, but they can no longer do this using the stolen gimmick that they built their entire company off of. The service that was Marikar is still apparently around today under the name Streetkart. And on their TripAdvisor website, the fallout of their lawsuit with Nintendo still remains quite present. Streetcart is healthy, adventurous recreation service that provides our customers the opportunity to ride our custom go-kart on the street. Streetcart is in no way a reflection of Nintendo, the game Mario Kart. We do not provide rental of costumes of Mario series. Apparently, Streetcart has moved away from Mario IP and now just uses generic superhero-related costumes, one of which appears to be a fat Spider-Man costume, so we'll have to wait and see if they run into IP issues there, but end of lightning round. This next story details some individuals that cross Nintendo by uploading various ROMs of AAA titles to a website, the outcome being quite the expensive lawsuit. In the world of video game piracy, unauthorized copies of video games usually take the form of ROMs, or a read-only memory file. 
The name refers to the process of copying a video game's data found on its disc or game cartridge and making this data available to be read and played on an emulator. ROM hosting websites gained popularity in the late 2000s and early 2010s as emulation became popular thanks to software such as Project 64 and the Dolphin emulator. The subjects of this legally contentious story that we're about to dive into involves an Arizona couple that created one of these ROM websites, that couple being Jacob and Christian Matias. This husband and wife duo were responsible for creating LoveRoms.com and LoveRetro.co. These sites were essentially a repository where one could find ROM downloads of Nintendo games and software from Nintendo's expansive library, as well as games from other publishers outside of Nintendo itself. Love ROMs was essentially a massive database of free games that people could download and play on an emulator. Thousands of games were hosted on their website, and Love ROMs spread around the internet by word of mouth, with the site eventually becoming the go-to website for folks in search of free top-shelf videos. Video games. Jacob and Christian did quite well for themselves. In fact, at the height of Love Rom's popularity, their website was bringing in close to 17 million page visitors a month, and the website featured plenty of advertisements as well that paid out to the couple. But with the majority of their ROM downloads being AAA Nintendo titles like Mario, Zelda, and Pokemon, it would only be a matter of time before Nintendo caught wind of this and uh, stepped in and upheld their reputation of being extremely copyright protective. Coming to see Love ROMs as the face of video game piracy, in July of 2018, Nintendo filed a civil complaint against Jacob Matias and his business, Matias Designs LLC. This complaint was later amended to add his wife Christian in it as well. Quote, the Love ROMs and Love Retro websites are among the most open and notorious online hubs for pirated video games, wrote Nintendo in their complaint. They also added, through the Love ROMs and Love Retro websites, defendants reproduce, distribute, publicly perform, and display a staggering number of unauthorized copies of Nintendo's video games, all without Nintendo's permission. Defendants are not casual gamers, but are instead sophisticated parties with extensive knowledge of Nintendo's intellectual property and the video game industry more generally. This complaint made clear that this couple was not authorized to distribute any of these ROMs on their website. Nintendo was seeking damages for what they saw as rampant piracy of their games and IP committed by this couple. The complaint suggested that Matias Designs LLC should be responsible for paying $150,000 dollars per game hosted on their platforms, and two million for each trademark that they had violated. Considering the fact that thousands of Nintendo games had been uploaded to their websites, that meant the company was requesting upwards of 100 million dollars in damages. Clearly spooked by this massive request of damages, the couple reacted quickly to Nintendo's complaint and promptly took down both of their websites, Love Retro and Love ROMs. In July of 2018, after both sites had been removed, Love ROMs would publish a statement to Facebook, quote, all Nintendo titles have been removed from the site. Hashtag will update you later. Around this time, Nintendo would issue a statement to Kotaku further elaborating on the damages they were seeking. Quote, this is a civil case involving multiple websites that host and promote legacy game ROMs for free and direct download. The sites include hundreds of pirated copies of Nintendo games for multiple Nintendo platforms. The most popular downloads on the website are Nintendo's first party titles that have reportedly been downloaded more than 60 million times. The case also involves the unauthorized use and promotions of Nintendo's registered trademarks and copyrights. With strong posturing from Nintendo in full effect, the Matias family would eventually admit wrongdoing and seem to be going all in on a settlement route. Several months later, in November of 2018, it was being reported that a settlement had been made between the couple and Nintendo. Jacob and his wife Christian had finished their negotiations with Nintendo, this negotiation ending in an eye-popping settlement. 
a settlement detailing that Jacob and Christian would pay out to the gaming giant $12,230,000 in damages. And after reaching this settlement, the couple would issue an apology to Nintendo on the internet. Our website, loveroms.com slash loveretro.co, previously offered and performed unauthorized copies of Nintendo games in violation of Nintendo's copyrights and trademarks. Loveroms.com slash loveretro.co acknowledges that it caused harm to Nintendo, its partners, and customers by offering infringing copies of Nintendo games, and has agreed to cease all such activities. To access legitimate Nintendo games online, please visit www.nintendo.com for more information about the Nintendo Game Store. The Arizona couple bent the knee and fully ate this settlement. And to be honest, at the time, many online saw this as a sort of David versus Goliath situation. Naturally, the settlement proved quite controversial, and the company's aggressive pursuance of this couple is often cited by Nintendo critics as an example of the company's brutal copyright enforcement. A common argument made against Nintendo is that the Matias family didn't technically cause any true harm to the company because a lot of the titles that they had been hosting on their websites as ROMs weren't available by Nintendo for purchase as they had been removed from shelves long ago and there was like no way to buy them. And while this is accurate in some examples, it's not completely true. As during the life cycle of the Love ROMs website, Nintendo had begun dipping its toes into virtual console products. And as years have passed, the company has even further embraced selling emulated versions of its retro games on consoles like what they're doing with the Switch right now. It's clear that Nintendo views ROM websites as direct competition to their own proprietary emulation packages. That being said, to me, this lawsuit was less about damages and it was more about sending a message so they could essentially, you know, nip the seed in the bud before ROM sites became an epidemic. Now, there's a looming threat around hosting a ROM website. And if this was the case, their scare tactic seemed to work at the time. In the wake of the Love ROM settlement, the second largest ROM website, EMU ROMs, was shut down by its owner. This host fearing that if he maintained his operations, Nintendo would come for him next. And as years have passed, ROM hosting websites have become fewer and far between as the threat of a Nintendo clapdown looms over any who dare host these files. As for Jacob and Christian, it's unknown what the couple is up to these days, and it's not even really been confirmed if they've ever had to make any payments to Nintendo. Needless to say, they'll be remembered throughout history as the example set by Nintendo when it comes to the these ROM websites, their case being pointed to by Nintendo critics as proof of Nintendo's aggressive intellectual property protection. Well, you made it to the end. Let me know what you thought about this video down below in the comments section and make sure to let me know who or what you want me to talk about next. I want to give a major shout out to the patrons. I appreciate you guys. Wavy web surf out. Peace.